flexibility, convenience, opportunity. Find your digital advantage in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Backed by the most trusted name in thoroughbred sales. Visit KeenelandDigital.com to learn more. Good morning. It is 10.09 Wednesday, October 20th. This is the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. I just want to wish a happy birthday to my dad, Russ, who watches the show. Happy birthday, man. Love you. Happy birthday to Joe's dad, Russ. This is Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. Yes, I was at Fenway Park last night. Yes, it was not a good night. Still 2-2. We're going to go to Houston. We're going to get it done. Let's go, Sox. That's all that needs to be said, Bill, about the Red Sox for today. Let's get it done, right? <laughs> um, Jonathan Green, general manager at DJ Stable. And uh, for those of you who, who don't know, you know, we're still fostering kittens and we try to do them in theme names and themes. Um, this crop, there's five of them. So, Joe, we decided to name them after the top five New York Jets in Jets history. So one, of course, is named Namath. And the other four are named First round draft pick 2022, first round draft pick 2023, for, because there just aren't, you know, five really top Jets to name these kittens. And we want them will, to be adopted. I will not stand for this Wayne Corbett erasure. I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> Won't have yeah. it. We can name them Corbett. And I, I, I mean, is there is there actually a, uh, you know, like a, a ring of. There's fame? a ring of honor. They won a Super Bowl, John. There was a. Well, in the, the Super Bowl, the year I was born, that was over 50 years ago. So. The most important Super Bowl in the history of football, however, because yeah. it led to the merger. Yeah. Uh, no, not in my lifetime. There haven't been that many. I, I can't, you know, I don't know. I love Vinny. Let's put his name a cat, Vinny. We can name so, a cat Vinny just because it'd be fun to have a cat named Vinny. In you Jersey. Know? Yo, meow. Yo, yeah. meow. Right? Vinny, come here. You want your breakfast? You want your breakfast? Yeah. You don't want no more? <laughs> the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. The Keeneland Fall Meet continues through October 30th. New Keeneland Select accounts receive a special $100 back after you wager $200 on Keeneland Racing this fall. Wager a total of $300 in the first 30 days and earn another $100 back. Visit KeenelandSelect.com to sign up. We were waiting for this story. Uh, we talked to, we touched on it about a month ago when, when the Breeders' Cup was deliberating. Well, it feels like that was the last time we were in the studio. I think that might be it. By the way, we're glad to have John back full time. Uh, still waiting for a week or so for him to decontaminate, and then then we'll be back in the studio most likely. Um, <clears throat> but the, so we, the Breeders' Cup was deliberating on whether or not to allow Bob Baffert's horses to run the Breeders' Cup. We obviously thought that he, they were going to allow him to because you know, it was just too short notice, and there wasn't I don't know there wasn't really any you know, specific statute or any kind of written rule to keep him out of it. Uh, so basically the, 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 the decision that they came to was, you know, they're going to let Bob Baffert's horse run horses run, but they're going to subject them to extra scrutiny, extra drug testing. Um, so a long, long statement, but it says just based on the totality of the circumstances, Breeders' Cup has decided to require all horses trained by Mr. Baffert to undergo enhanced out of competition, pre and post race testing, and other security protocols at his own expense in order to participate in the 2021 Breeders' Cup World Championships at Del Mar. You know, I, I think this is the right call. You know, I think this is probably the best that they could have done on such short notice to, you know, to pacify the public who, who wants Bob Baffert to be, you know, scrutinized and, and kind of pay some kind of price for what's happened in the past year with his five very high profile drug positives. Uh, but, you know, my feeling, my only real takeaway from this is that this is why we need HISA, I think. This is yet another reason why we need this, you know, we USADA to come in and, you know, take control of our drug policy because this is like, they're just like kind of making this up out of thin air. This policy, the Breeders' Cup is creating this entirely new policy for this one guy. And there's just, I don't know, they, I, it seems like they're, they're grasping here at just like, oh, well, here's how we, you know, uh, here's how, how we make both sides happy. Here's how we make the, the Baffert supporters and Bob Baffert's owners happy. By the way, you know, there are some Baffert owners on the board of directors. So there's, you know, an inherent conflict of interest here, which is yet another reason why these organizations should not be making these policies for these major, major events. 
But beside that, I just think that, you know, it shouldn't be up to the Brutus Cup board of directors or individual tracks or individual jurisdictions to try to come up with, you know, a meaningful you know, drug policy. It should there should be a uniform standard across the board because it kind of looks, you know, it looks like a joke. It looks like, again, Mickey Mouse stuff to have the Breeders Cup coming out six weeks before they're not even like three or four weeks before the event with this, you know, brand new drug policy just for Bob Baffert with no written rule on the books to base it off of. So that that to me is my issue. What I don't disagree necessarily with the policy. I just think that this is yet another example of why we need to, someone to take this out of our hands as a sport. Yeah, Joe, I agree with uh, everything that you said there. But uh, the bottom line is they got this right. Uh, they, there's no way they could have kept him from running in the Breeders' Cup, uh, especially at this late date. Maybe if they had done something way back in May, we'd be talking about a different story. And, and then, you know, so that they're going to let him run and they're going to, you know, put him under the microscope the whole time. And if you remember, this is essentially the exact same thing that the Stronach Group did for the Preakness after uh, the Medina Spirit uh, positive came out for the Kentucky Derby. The, a couple other things, too. Um, and I don't know. I'd have to go back and do a deep dive. But I think most of the the things that they're they're doing for baffle without a competition testing and security uh i'm not sure that's anything all that new i think they do that for most horses they're the, the breeders cup you know has always been you know very uh diligent about you know real uh tight security for the horses i know out of competition competition testing uh happens all the time and then the other point you brought up and, and i agree that you know heisa would fix this but even though I agree with the decision, the conflicts of interest here were just terrible. And, you know, I don't know what you do about that. You know, prominent owners in the Breeders' Cup on the Breeders' Cup board uh, are going to have horses trained by somebody like Bob Baffert. But, uh, you know, that's something that everybody should look at down the road. You know, is there a better way of doing this? Perhaps. But for now, they got it right. You guys, you know, basically took my two major points, which was number one, it's an inherent conflict of interest. It's not even like close. Um, over 50% of the decision makers in this ruling have direct business associations with Bob Baffert. If that's not a conflict of interest, then I don't know what is. Um, you know, that being said, should they have, you know, have immediately removed themselves from the situation and say, hey, I have to abstain. I can't vote on this because uh, because of my inherent business relationship with Bob Baffert. Yes, that should have been done. Um, but honestly, that would have left like a handful of people to make this decision, um, you know, as far as whether or not it should be done. And, and even if they even if they recuse themselves from the decision making, you know that there's still pressure on the other people who are on the board. Um, it's, it's basically like saying, hey, I'm not going to vote on this name, uh, you know, uh, contest that we have coming up. But by the way, it would really be cool if we named the horse X, Y. Z. Now, you know, Bill wouldn't give a crap, but Joe, I think, would listen and be like, hey, you know, John really want you. Know, maybe I should think about it. Maybe I should move this name up from third to second because we all work together and there's there's the camaraderie and there's just this inherent, you know, trying to get things done. So the fact that there's such a, a you know, a blatant conflict of interest, you know, blew my mind as far as this decision making. Bill, you're 100 percent right that from a legal standpoint, they really couldn't do anything else other than what they put out there, because if they made the scrutiny too deliberate, then Baffert's attorneys would come back and say this is unfair and unjust and it would get kicked down the road. And basically his horses would run in the, in the Breeders' Cup anyway. Um, and if they made it too loose, you know, then it would be like, well, wait a second. How come all the other people who didn't break the rules in other jurisdictions have to abide by the Breeders' Cup rules? Um, I can tell you as an owner who has run horses in the Breeders' Cup and has a horse in one of the races for the upcoming Breeders' Cup, um, you know, in a couple of weeks, the, there is no difference, not one iota of difference of what my horses have to test and go through and what the Baffert barn has to go through. The only thing that is, you know, is, is separate isn't the rulemaking or isn't the testing pre or post um, or anything like that. It's that, you know, Baffert or Baffert's owners technically have to foot the bill for the scrutiny and the security, whereas you know, my horses are, you know, all the testing and all the security is all taken care of by the Breeders' Cup organization. Um, Baffert's owners have to do it. Otherwise, there is not one difference. It's it, Joe, I think you used the right word. It's a joke. There's not one bit of difference in the rulemaking and the scrutiny between what my horses have to go through and what Baffert's horses have to go through. 
And the other thing I would add is that, you know, this, I think, should be the standard for every race, for every track, for every trainer. There should be out of competition testing. There should be, you know, I, not, not to the trainer's expense, but there, th this is, you know, the, I, I just hate the idea that, oh, well, we're going above and beyond and we're doing out of competition testing for Bob Heffern's horses for the Breeders' Cup. Like, why, why is that not the standard across the country? And it is because we don't have a uniform drug policy. We don't have HISA or something similar to make everything uniform and to have, you know, the, the drug enforcement taken out of our hands. We just are making it up as we go along. And it just, it, it looks so bad. I, like I said, in the individual decision from the Breeders' Cup, you know, I, I, I can't really complain about it. You know, it, it is what it is. I think they, they did what they could on such short notice, but, you know, just the process stinks to high heaven. For, for, for this and for so many, uh, you know, decisions and, and so many deliberations across the country when it comes to, you know, punishing or, or penalizing trainers who have had drug positives. It just stinks because there's so many conflicts of interest and there's just there's no uniform rule on the books for this kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm just, I, you know, I've, like we were saying last week, we've had enough of the Baffert stuff. We like you know, this whole year has been a year of Bob Baffert and, and legal actions. And, you know, it's, it's really tiresome, but you know, this, you know, I think this was, this was the, the best of a bunch of crappy options for the Breeders' Cup to still let his horses run and not open them up to legal challenges, but yet make it look like they were doing something special to keep, you know, Bob Baffert's horses clean. It's just, you know, this is, this is the best they could do, I guess. And that's, that's unfortunate. And Joe, the, the one other thing that, that I, I failed to mention is I don't think the Breeders Cup wants to be in this. I don't think they want to be in this kind of morass and decision making, even down to like in their press release. The last sentence of the press release was Breeders Cup looks forward to the uniform rules and enforcement mechanisms that the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority Anti-Doping and Medication Control Program will bring to our sport. Basically, like we don't want to deal with this nonsense. We just want to have the show and have the races and 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 enjoy it and have the party we don't want to be in the rules and regulations and medication um you know uh, uh you know decision making when it comes to all this please somebody else come in and take this off our plate so i think even they recognize that they were like out of their depths yeah i mean and nor should they be that's that's the whole point yeah, is that exactly. this should not fall to the breeders cup in the first place but once it does it's there's there's certainly some bad looks involved here CDN Riders Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Racing continues this week at Keeneland with the Grade 3 Sycamore Stakes on Friday and the Grade 2 Lexus Raven Run for three-year-old fillies on Saturday. Uh, also, the Grade 3 Rudin Riddle Dowager Stakes on Sunday for, for marathoners. Uh, Keeneland November Sale just a few weeks away as well, starting with Book 1 on November 10th and continuing through November 19th. Uh, new for 2021, Keeneland will offer a single session dedicated to racehorses on the final day of the sale. You see John with the catalog right there. That's not just a prop. He's actually looking Looking through it. Um, and that's just a couple updates on some <laughs> John's skimming face. <laughs> just a couple updates on some horses pointing to the November sale. Uh, Pink Peppermint, who's a half sister to this weekend's grade two Sands Point winner, Fluffy Socks, will sell his hip 2644 with Mill Ridge Farm. And uh, Oleksandra's full brother, Prince Alexander, just became her second stakes place sibling. Uh, grade one winner, Oleksandra, remember her, her beating the boys in the Jiper. She sells in full to Into Mischief his hip 187 with Blue Water Sales. Definitely looking forward to her going through the ring as well as a ton of top class race mares as well. So looking forward to that and the rest of the Keeneland meet as well. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. six on debut with the promise of bigger things to come justify he's on the dizzying ascent to great what do you do when the experts compare you to legends justify has won the kentucky derby he's unstoppable he won the Preakness. justify is the 13th triple crown winner you justify it 
The TDN Writers Room was brought to you by Coolmore. We're going to talk to Adrian Wallace, who does nomination sales a little bit later about a bunch of this, but Coolmore released their stud fees on Tuesday with Uncle Mo at the top of the roster at 160000 which is down slightly from 175000 obviously still in high demand. Triple Crown winner is Justify. will stand for 100000 and American Farrell for 80000 And with uh, Jack Christopher, expected as a favorite for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, Munning saw a big jump from 40000 to 85000 So over twice of his, his 2020 stud fee. Obviously, Munning's still in very high demand. Coolmore Sires were represented by several stakes winners over the weekend with Panfield, a champion in Hong Kong by looking at Lucky, one of John's favorite sires, uh, adding another Group 2 win to his resume, plus Juvenile Cook Creek winning the Rocky Run Stakes at Delaware Park for Uncle Mo. Um, an important recent maiden winner is overseas for a few of Ashford's first crop sires. Uh, more Vincent Omnia became the 21st winner for first crop sire Caravaggio at Hayda last Friday, and he currently leads his class by winners. Uh, another t- top first crop sire, Practical Joke, saw his first winner in Japan with Dugit's four-length winning debut. Uh, just to kind of piggyback off the last segment, yet another reason why we need a uniform, a unifying body in racing to police these things. This was a big story earlier this week. Uh, the Delaware Park stewards have fi- suspended find an, and, and find an owner, trainer, and assistant trainer for improper or inhumane treatment of a horse diagnosed last spring with a 50% tendon tear. Basically, uh, the, the, veterinar- the veterinarian at Delaware diagnosed this horse with a tendon tear and said that the horse needed eight to 12 months off the horse is named food and wine. Basically the horse was then drugged in order to mask that lameness and brought back on the track much earlier than the veterinarian suggested and the veterinarian to their credit uh, reported this to the Delaware stewards and the Delaware racing commission. And, you know, I guess this is the system sort of working because there was a punishment of some kind. And I'm sure this stuff happens more often than we want to admit across the country with basically no repercussions, but the, the suspensions and the fines were so minimal and the owner got a $2,500 suspension and suspended 30 days. The trainer, same thing, $2,500, 30 days. The assistant trainer was fined a thousand dollars and suspended 15 days. I don't know like what the Delaware Racing Commission, the Delaware Stewards can legally do, but this seems like the kind of thing that should get people banned for life from that track and from that state. Like I, you know, I'm, I feel free to educate me on what they're legally able to do, but I don't understand how this kind of thing gets this little of a suspension and a fine. Like this is this is everything that is wrong with racing right now, and it's just it's yet another example of something that happens on a smaller track that we are very lucky does not get reported in the national news because this would be a five alarm fire type story if it were actually reported nationwide it's it's i guess fortunately something that we are only talking about on the show and some other people are talking about but this is the kind of stuff that is is emblematic of a broken system where the welfare of the horse is so often not the top priority as it should be uh, these the, the suspensions and fines were a joke. Uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, Joe, the the welfare of the horse has to be come first in every single situation. And if you're an owner trainer in this sport and you don't believe that or you don't abide by that rule, I, I totally agree. There's no place for you in this sport whatsoever. So, yes, they should have given them uh, stricter suspensions and uh you know, it is just leaves a bad taste in your mouth, this, this sort of thing. The thing, too, is, is you know, this was a little bit to me, the gang that couldn't shoot straight. How on earth did they think they were going to get away with this? Of course, had a bow tendon. The, the vet said he needed eight to 12 months off. And all of a sudden they, they give the horse presumably some sort of painkiller and have it out working in the morning. Who's not going to notice that sort of thing? So, you know, that they. They deserve to get caught. They deserve to be suspended. They deserve a stricter suspension. But it's in general. And, you know, it's, it's amazing we even are talking about this. How are there people in this game that still don't put the priority in the health and well-being of the horse first? Uh, but there are. And, you know, these are the type of people that have no business being involved in this sport. And Bill, you, you mentioned it, you know, just now, as far as like, how do they think they're going to get away with it? Number one, number two, 
why? Why do this? There are so many other options as far as, um, you know, donating a horse to a nonprofit to, to repurpose it. I mean, they'll do all the, the, the heavy lifting. They'll be the ones who will rehab the horse for eight to 12 months to make sure that the, the tendon heals better. So the horse could be repurposed and, and, and go on with a, a different part of the, of its career for the remainder of its life. So like, why, if, if the end game was to get it off the vets list, then they were going to run it for what, $5,000, you know, and, and hope it got claimed after being on the vets list. It just didn't, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that, that, you know, why they would even try to get away with it. Um, you know, not that I condone people, you know, of any stretch, um, you know, giving a horse any kind of performance enhancing drugs and run in a stake race where you say, well, if they won, they would be hundreds, if not millions of dollars, if they got it right, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, you know, but, but why even try to try to do the crime um, at that level, you know, where, even if the horse jumped through all the hoops and everything and didn't get hurt worse, um, that it would, you know, where would it be at, at this point? Um, and I don't think that we even touched on this because we had so much news coming through over, over the summer and, and the fall, but wasn't Delaware Park the place where um, that trainer, you know, went after one of her horses with a pitchfork because it, it, it wasn't, you know, acting properly. And the, the powers that be on the board at Delaware said, well, I believe that, that, you know, this trainer, and I'll use her name because it's in the news, it was Amber Cobb. You know, I believe that Amber Cobb was the most articulate trainer that we've ever had in front of the board. It was almost like they were swooning over her um, as far as like, oh, she spoke so intelligently compared to the other people who were talking, you know, against her where they couldn't, you know, put together a sentence to, to basically save their lives. And, and therefore, you know, we don't condone this kind of action of, you know, pitchforking a horse, but she was just so articulate. We were just, our breaths were taken away. We couldn't, we couldn't, you know, give her, uh, you know, we had to reduce, you know, the, the, the penalty for her because she was just so gosh darn articulate. Uh, it, you know, you talk about the, the 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 gang that couldn't shoot straight, Bill. I wasn't sure if you were talking about the owner trainer and his wife, who's the assistant trainer, or the powers that be at Delaware Park. Yeah, well, and listen, anybody that's that's followed and bet Delaware Park over the years, I used to call it the land of make believe because you would get trainers like Jamie Ness who would come there and win, you know, thirty percent, and then they would ship those horses up to Saratoga and they wouldn't run a step. And that told you all you needed to know about what was going on at Delaware Park. Like I said, the, the land of make-believe where trainers can win at any percentage and nobody bats an eye. Yeah, well, I just, I agree with both of your points that, you know, why, why do this? It reminds me of the story we talked about a little, a little while ago where the guy brought the horse off the five-year layoff to run in a bottom level maiden claim. We're like, why, why would you not just donate the horse or try to find a new home for the horse? Like you're really gonna go to all this trouble and all this effort to squeeze a couple of dollars out of a horse at, at, you know, an injured horse or an old horse. Like it just, it makes absolutely no sense. And yeah, I, I, you know, Delaware has a lot to answer for in the last couple of months, but you know, unfortunately this is what happens when people aren't looking. And then, you know, in general, people are not looking at some of these lower level tracks in Delaware and West Virginia and Arizona, you know, there was a story last week about turf paradise, having all these racetrack concerns, you know, and then whether or not they're going to have a meet and be able to, to conduct racing safely. It's just, you know, there are, there are very few people watching at these smaller tracks and there's just so many shenanigans that happen that, you know, put horses in danger. And it's, you know, I overall, I think that racing is doing a better job at the higher levels, at least of, of policing things and, you know, making racetracks safer and, and increasing veterinary transparency and all this stuff that we should have been doing for decades, honestly. But at least it's happening at the upper levels of the game now. Still at the bottom levels, there's just there's so much of this crap and so much of this garbage. It just makes you exhausted, it makes you exhausted to have to talk about this and continue to defend this sport all the time. It's just I, I don't like again, like there's no defense for any of this stuff. There's absolutely no defense for it. And yet here we are every week trying to be advocates for the sport and this stuff pops up and it's like, it feels like a lost cause. I, I know it's not. And I know that, you know, help is on the way hopefully in the future. And, you know, we can, we can put the finishing touches on the, the kind of general, uh, you know, thrust of reform and the, the, the feeling of, of, kind of the come to Jesus moment. I think racing had in the last couple of years that has spurred some good things and some good reforms, but you know, this stuff still exists and it exists more than I think a lot of people in racing want to admit. And 
It just, it, there's, there's no excuse for it. it. It has to be cleaned up, but it's not going to be unless people are ruled off the grounds for good. These suspensions and fines are not going to do it. And we've seen that time and time again with, with cheating trainers and we'll see it again with animal abusers. It's just, unless they get banned for life, unless there's that, that specter of never being able to be on a race track again, it's just going to keep happening, unfortunately. So we're welcoming a new sponsor this week, another new sponsor that's near and dear to my heart as a New York bred, the New, new York, York Thoroughbred Thorough Breeding and Development Fund. We're excited to have them. It's obviously a great program. You know, we've you know we've seen over the past ten years, especially that New York breds can run anywhere in the world and, and compete at the, at the top levels, and that's that's definitely a credit to people at the NYTB because it wasn't always that wasn't always the case. There was a time when you know I did a story on this a couple of years ago when I was up at Saratoga. There was a time where New York bred full crops were declining pretty steadily but the incentive programs and, and the, the great racing uh, purse structure that they have has really bumped that back up and it's it's once again a program on the rise so we're, we're honored to have them as a sponsor and you know, it's good timing because the, the facing tip in Saratoga fall mix sale returned this past Monday after a one year hiatus in 2020 due to COVID. Um, the sale came back with, with positive results and saw the most expensive horse through its ring in its eight year history. A New York bred weanling filly by Cal Catalina Cruiser um, that sold to Reeves thoroughbred racing, Dean and Patty Reeves for $195,000. Um, and New York based sires were also represented and led by a $100,000 cult by leading New York sire Freud. Freud is a hard knocker, man. He is still out here producing nice horses, especially on the turf. Very, very admirable sire. Um, and an exciting New York bred son, son of Candy Rye got his second stakes win on Monday. Senbei, who we saw win the funny side uh, at Saratoga over the summer, won the New York Breeders Futurity at Finger Lakes by four lengths for Christophe Clement and owners Reef Serra Bread Racing. Just mentioned them. And Darlene Bilinski, a two-year-old was bred by, uh, by Dr. Jerry Bilinski and folded his ball dog. Florida Farm, Farm looks to have an exciting future. Um, and I know they have some some new uh, breeding announcements that John knows a little bit about, about as well. Well, what's great about the New York program is, you know, they make it very simple. And, and as a breeder who is out of state, I appreciate that. So we actually have two resident mares um, that live in New York year round and, and are bred to New York stallions. And obviously they, they get the benefits of being able to run in New York bred races um, going forward, which, you know, for most of the year in New York, the maiden special weight races for New York breds are 80, 90, a hundred thousand dollars. And the AO event is just as much. So, you know, you have a chance if you win, you know, the maiden special weight race against New York breds, and the A other than against New York breads, you have a chance to make hundred to $120,000 right off the bat. So that, that's with only winning two races, which is great. Um, and then they've also, you know, over the past couple of years have included um, something, you know, with regard to the sales. So which we obviously have a lot of breeding stock sales coming up where if you buy a mare for $50,000 or more at public auction, and bring it to New York, that fall can be considered a New York bread, regardless of if it's by a New York, or, you know, uh, by a New York stallion or not. So they're making it very simple to bring in higher priced mares um, to fall out in New York to get that New York bread. And case in point, Joe, I don't even know if, if, if I mentioned this before, but we actually bought a Constitution New York bread at the Saratoga sale um, because it was a New York bread. And I mean, he was gorgeous. And, and we actually, you know, we kept calling him the man. He's the man. He's the man because he looked so outstanding compared to, um, you know, a couple of the, the rest of the horses that were on that list. Um, and to have a Constitution New York bread cult, I mean, it was just, it blew our mind that we were able to kind of pair those two together. So kudos to New York Breeding Program for making the rules simple for guys like me um, to understand. And also another great idea, being here on the show and being a sponsor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, John is, is definitely invested in the New York bread program. I'm not personally financially invested, but I'm invested in seeing New York breads do well. Like I said, as a New York bread myself and a big supporter of New York racing. And it's, it's just great, like I said, to have seen the resurgence of that program in the last 10, 15 years or so. They're doing a lot of things right. And we're very happy and honored to have them on the show as a sponsor. And we'll be right back after this message from the New York, New York Thoroughbred Breeding and Development Fund. Now more than ever, it's time to get with the program because New York Reds start with an advantage. New York Reds run for serious green. At Belmont and Saratoga, New York Bred maidens run for up to $75,000 and allowance horses for up to $85,000. And serious New York Bred owners can collect awards of up to $20,000 per horse per race in open company. So get back with the program, seriously.
So this is the final week. We are wrapping up our super popular Honor Code slash Lane's End Name the Cult contest. We have our last three finalists. Oh, and we have a special guest sitting in as well, Bill Farish from Lane's End. Thanks for coming on, Bill. Thanks for having me on. Glad to have you. Glad to you guys sponsored this. It's been, you know, it's, it's exceeded all of our expectations how popular this has been. People want to name horses and they like the show, I think. Um, but so we thank you guys for sponsoring it. We have our final three selections, just in case you're tuning in for the first time. The way we did it is we, Bill, John and I each picked, Bill Finley, John and I each picked a finalist each week for three weeks. This is that third week. And then our producer, Patty, added a horse, added a name for the 10th the name, put them all together. We voted and we have a winner. But first, let's get to our finalists for this week. Uh, so my finalist this week, and I, I swear I'm not trying to do this, Skip, but yet again, I picked a, a Skip Anderson name um, this week. I, I, I really like this one. It's Lenegade, you know, in, in honor of John Green's father and the Green Group founder, Len Green. Lenegade, really like that name. Uh, so that's my finalist for this week. Toss it over to you, Bill Finley. Yeah, Sean Cronin submitted Knowing Me New. Excuse me, this is a mouthful. Knowing Me No New. That was what I went for. Very, it's an very nice. right? Is it an ABBA reference? Didn't Patty say that? Definitely an ABBA reference. Let me help okay, you. Thank pop you. culture thank there, Bill. The voice of God. Appreciate it's, that. It's definitely. Right. Yeah. Bill, Bill Finley, you know, back in the 70s, there was a band called ABBA. I don't know if you were, you were probably like, what, 40 or 50 years old when that was going on. But. <laughs> Yeah, they were they were they were a cool band for a while there. Um, so it's a great reference. And then the Skip Anderson show continues because he came up with another great name that I selected, un, unknowing that it was Skip. Um, and the name was Ice Code Beer, which I thought was very very funny, and it was great that we got to use um, you know Honor Code's name in the uh, in, in the text of, of ice code beer. So Skip, thank you for your, I think we got like over 300 name selections and requests and then Skip threw in like another hundred on top of that, you know? And so it, it was, it was a very, very popular contest. Um, and I think it was great because Bill Farish, I think when we had you on the show, a few months ago, we asked you the question of which stallion on your farm is undervalued the most. And you said honor code. And that actually prompted us from DJ Stable to go ahead and look at more honor codes, which is how we ended up picking up this cult. So there is a direct response to uh, to what you say and uh, on the air and and how it benefits, uh, you know, your, your stallions and, and hopefully our program as well. Well, that's so great. Um, yeah. That's the right that. Yeah. And so so <laughs> Patty had our our. our final finalist which was honor ricky um so the mix of honor code and, and nikki new um so those are the 10 finalists I, we're splashing them up on the screen all 10 of them so yeah, we got four finalists from skip anderson who's our number one fan at the, at the show and is a sheep farmer oh, let's see some pictures of his beautiful sheep his herd of sheep uh, Skip is, is, is a great guy and is always, he always participates in, in whatever we got going on. So it was, it was no surprise. Everybody who picked a finalist, you don't go home empty handed. Each of the 10 finalist submissions get an honor code hat presented by Lane's End. Um, so Skip gets four of those. Uh, he's got, he doesn't have four heads, but he's going to have to, he's going to have to rotate day after day. Um, so, so that's a, a good prize for everybody who, who submitted. And I just want to thank everybody who submitted a name as well. We got so much feedback and so many submissions and then we really appreciate it. it. Makes us feel good. And I'm sure it makes the folks at, at Lane's End feel good that you guys are so invested in this honor code cult who is going to be on the track next year for DJ Stable. And before we get to the winner, we have Bill Farish on. Let's get his opinion on who he would have, what name he would have picked. I like uh, Whistleblower the best. That was one of our first finalists from Bill. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. It, it, did, make, it did make a finalist. Good. Yeah. It's, I like one word names like that. And, and you know, it's got, it's got uh, good relevance with Donner Code. So I yeah. like Whistleblower. Cool. Um, so Bill did not get an official vote. Despite being despite being the big cheese at Lane's End, who's sponsoring the contest, did not get an official vote. No, so but I have another honor code called you can help me name. <laughs> Let's do it again. Yeah. We'll do it. We'll do it. 2.0. Um, yeah, I mean, people, people love this. Um, so, yeah, everybody gets a hat that, that got a finalist. And congratulations to Skip for sending in four. So are we ready? Are we ready to reveal the winner? 
And we've already submitted this to the Jackie Club, by the way. And they they already approved it. So this is the name. Drum roll, please. Let me get the editing team to pipe in a drum roll because I, I can't really do it here where I'm sitting. The winner is Stay Honor Good Side, Skip Anderson, yeah. my dude. And I think, you know, I, this was my first finalist that I picked. We got a lot of votes. We, we, we went in a room. We all, you know, went in the conclave and then the white smoke came out of the top of, of the church and, and we finally decided on a name. Stay Honor Good Side, I thought, was, was very clever because obviously it incorporates the honor code name and as well as kind of the Nikki knew, what did Nikki know part of it. So, John, it's your horse. What do you think? Now, I'm really pleased not only with the responses that we've received, um, but also that, uh, you know, this is such a classy name. And, and you know, that's always a concern when we when we send things out to the to the general masses of what are you going to come back with? And, and I was really, really pleased um, that Stay on Her Good Side, you know, was selected. Um, I know that he will uh, definitely run up to that name and, and, and it'll be, you know, plastered all over a lot of winter circle pictures and a lot of trophies coming up. Um, he is an Ontario bred, so he will, uh, you know, you know, likely go up to Woodbine and, and hopefully be king and uh, continue on with Mark Cassie's program of winning the cup and saucer and some of the, uh, the great the handicap and some of the other really great two-year-old stake races um, that are coming up and hopefully uh, the Breeders' Cup. So hopefully not only will we have Lane's End Honor Code hats, but we'll hopefully have Breeders' Cup Stay on our Good Side hats as well. Um, and and, and Bill Ferris, I can't thank you enough for uh, for you know willingness to to be involved with with this contest and and really you know Honor Code genuinely in in our estimation is one of the most undervalued horses that's out there and I know you guys have um, an announcement coming up with stud fees for 2022 and I really hope that that he stays you know, in that lane of the 15 to $20,000 stud fees, despite the fact he's got Max Player and Maracuya and, and feel the, the the fear and a lot of other horses that are going out to California for the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, he's, he really, uh, you know, he's he's sitting there at the top of the three third crop sire list for grade one winners. He's tied with, with Liam's map at the moment with three grade one winners. Um, he's got two, two real shots at the Breeders' Cup, we think. Um, and you know, he just, he really is, is doing very well. And for whatever reason, he's, he's, uh, stays undervalued and underrated and, uh, but that's okay. He'll, he'll grind it out. And, uh, we're excited to have honor AP here who, uh, you know, of course is the only three-year-old cult to beat, um, authentic last year or year before last. So, um, you know, I, I think he's got a lot going for him and, and, you know, we appreciate you doing this. This, uh, which could, you know, because it obviously helps promote Honor Code as well. Yeah, no, I mean, it was a, it was a good partnership, and, and we thank you guys for coming on. Listen, you don't have too many chances to to get into the AP Indy family. You know, one of the last great champion sons of AP Indy. So, you know, I, I think he should be a very popular sire, and obviously, Max Player has a big shot at the, in the Classic as well. So that that can't hurt. Um, and we we definitely hope that we drummed up some interest for him. This was a great great idea, John. We appreciate you 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 know participating and, and bringing the, the horse up and, and letting the audience name them and, and Bill Farish and everybody at Lane's End. We also thank you as well. Uh, so without further ado, we'll be right back after this message from Honor Code and Lane's End. Honor Code, a multiple grade one winner from the final crop of the legendary AP Indy. Never off the board in 11 starts, he was crowned champion older horse before retiring. Now he is living up to the promise of his pedigree. With progeny like grade one winners Honor AP, Max Player, and Maracuja, and multiple six-figure yearling sales, Honor Code stands to continue his sire's legacy at Lane's End. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we are thrilled to bring on this week the guy who does nomination sales at Kumar. We're very grateful for the new sponsorship, Adrian Wallace, new dad as well, or third kid. <laughs> Very yeah. good, yep. Uh, Penelope Jane arrived last Thursday um, on time, as I said before, unlike her, both her parents, who are notoriously late for pretty much everything they do. Uh, but she's, she arrived, she's healthy and well, and touch wood, it's a very early days, but she, we're getting through the nights okay, and uh, yeah, no, all, all good. 
And we appreciate you making time to come on with us. We're probably splashing up a photo of a very cute baby right now. That's what the fans, what the fans love. That's what they tune in for. But yeah, so Adrian, lots of, lots of, lots to talk about as always at Coolmore. But I wanted to start with your background and, and how you got started in racing. It's detect a little bit of an accent. I assume um, you got you got your, your schooling in Ireland. But uh, can you tell us about your background in racing and how you ended up at Coolmore? Yeah, so um, my my family owns a, a small stud farm uh, in Tipperary in Ireland called uh, Green Anne House Stud. Um, the farm is it was run by my parents. My dad is a doctor, um, and my mum. Uh, the farm came from her side of the family, and so she bred and raised horses, mostly jumps horses. And we grew up showing. Always had a love of horses, showing horses and 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 hunting horses. And my brother Mark um, used to be assistant trainer for Aidan O'Brien back when he took over Bally Doyle from Vincent. So he spent uh, a couple of years there before moving on to John Ox um, and then to, to Mick Channon in England. And then he went out on his own as a trainer in, in Newmarket, uh, trained a good sprinter called Ben Bourne, who won the Prix de l'Abbé. Um, and then he moved to France to train, or not to France, but to, to Australia to train for a few years and um, packed it in about six years ago, moved back to Tipperary, and he's managing the farm um, for us and, and, and does a great job. We actually bred a filly called Mother Earth this year who won the, the Thousand Guineas in Newmarket for for uh, Mr. Magner, Tabor and Smith. So that was a kind of a, it was a nice, a nice, um, a nice story to it. So hopefully we'll see her uh, in a couple of weeks in the Breeders' Cup. Hey, Adrian, thanks for joining us. It's Bill Finley here. Um, we got you at a good time because... Coolmore released all its uh, stud fees for 2022. Uh, a lot to talk about here, but uh, I think the one that I was most surprised was a reduction in the, in the stud fee for American Pharaoh from 100,000 to uh, 80,000. I mean, obviously he's a good sire, he's gotten off to a good start. Uh, could you take us through the decision and, and why the reduction in the stud fee there? We thought that, listen, he's doing very, very well. He's had, he's had three grade one winners. He's very much perceived as a, an international sire now. I think he's probably one dirt horse away or one good dirt horse away from keeping him really current uh, in this market. He covered 200 mares last year, so he's, he still remains very popular. Um, I think I was just looking down the sales results early this morning and you know he, he had still had 17 yearlings uh, bring over uh, 200,000 at the sales in Keeneland. So he remains very, very relevant. But we thought, listen, if he's until he gets that group one winner on dirt really in this country people are starting to perceive him maybe as a bit of a turf star so we just thought to make to keep him relevant to keep him in the spotlight we had to drop him a little bit um and we think he'll do that i mean he's he's had group one winners in the usa he had a european champion two-year-old last year in van gogh in europe uh, he's had a group one winner in japan um you know phillies like Merneith and harvey's little goyle over here are, are continuing to, to have flown the flag from this year along with our own as time goes by, who, who was a dual group two winner in grade one place down in California. But we're, we, you know, we realized that he, he needs to, to do it on the, on the dirt as well. Um, so I think that was, that was our main reason uh, for dropping him a little bit. Yeah. And, and Adrian, thank you so much for coming on. And this uh, is perfect timing because obviously, again, you just announced the uh, 2022 stud fees coming out. And Bill mentioned, you know, American Pharaoh, who I think is great value now at, at $80,000. And a couple of the other stallions that, that I had highlighted as a breeder um, that I wanted to circle back on. One is looking at Lucky, um, who I think, you know, dollar for dollar is one of the most consistent stallions here in the States. He throws runners. And I know when you're trying to make your mare, um, you know, you need to have good first, second falls and, and he's one that we've used time and time again. I was glad to see that that he's at 15,000. And then for the past couple of weeks, I've been, you know, on the Mendelssohn bandwagon, um, telling everyone who would listen, you know, from the July sale to the September sale to even when we just got back from Goffs, just how outstanding the Mendelssohn's look. And you guys obviously must see that as well, because um, here's a sire that that is entering, you know, kind of a critical point in time before the horses, his horses start to run. And yet you didn't have to reduce his stud fee because there's I'm assuming that there's such international interest in the horse. There is. I mean, if if any, I mean, we're, we're we're very privileged and lucky to to have a, a strong group of of stallions from you know Justify Pharaoh and Uncle Mo on down to the the young unproven horses like Cupid and and uh, and uh, Motown. But in between there, you've got a horse like as you say, like like Mendelssohn, who yes is on the verge of having his first runners next year, so is 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 obviously unproven, but 
is there a better horse in America in terms of the ingredients that go in to make a stallion? You know, he's the, he's 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 by uh, a sire of sires who was taken too early from us in Scott Daddy. He's a brother to Beholder and into mischief, as obviously as well documented. And he's also received well, and being a three million dollar yearling, he was he's obviously a very very good looking horse. Um, coupled that with being a Breeders' Cup winner and a runa- runaway winner of the UA Derby winner, and also running well in races like the the Travers over here while being being trained in Ireland. You know, that's that's obviously it shows his durability and and his ability as a uh, as a racehorse. So I think he's got those ingredients, which which are obviously you know very important in in uh, in having a successful sire. And then he's been very popular uh, in his first three years at Stud, and, and will be I'm sure in his fourth. So we we felt that last year he covered um, close to 200 mares again. Um, he's been very very popular throughout in his first three years. We think he'll be popular again given given how well received his yearlings were. Um, so we, we felt it was necessary to keep his, his price solid at that. Um, we didn't want to raise him. I think we, we could have raised him probably because of the demand, how, how, hard, how high demand has been in the last few years. Um, but we felt that, you know, we don't like raising the, the stud fee in the fourth year. It just seems a little bit... Wanted to ask nothing, about nothing, nothing to do. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Adrian. Um, I just I wanted to ask about Caravaggio because he's a horse that I think has taken off in Europe, but we haven't really seen much of his progeny here in the U.S. He's now come he's now come over to the U.S. and is standing at, at Ashford in Kentucky. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you guys decided to bring him over to the U.S. at this point? I mean, obviously he's a son of Scat Daddy. There aren't too many stallion sons of Scat Daddy left, and justify you guys have another one. We remember him winning the Commonwealth Cup so brilliantly at Ascot. Can you talk about the decision to bring him over? Well, I mean, not, not many people may know this, but Caravaggio was actually born here. Um, he was bred by our director of sales, uh, Charlie O'Connor, and his father-in-law, uh, Rick Imbert. Um, so they, they used to own the dam, Mecca Octaves, by, uh, by Holy Bull. So he was born here, had his, had his, you know, lived here until he was uh, bought, bought privately by, the, by uh, Mr. Magner and, and partners, Tabor and Smith to go to Bally Doyle. So he lived here and he was a horse that obviously, you know, dual, gra- dual graded winner at Royal Ascot in, uh, uh, as a two-year-old and again as a, as a three-year-old winning the Commonwealth. Very, very good sprinter and a horse that we wanted to have back here um, pretty much from the moment we heard he was going to retire. We didn't get him the first year. We didn't get him the second year. Luckily, we got him in the fourth year. Um, so we begged, we begged to have him. And, and I think when you look at him, he's very much an American type of horse. You know, he's, he's very well built. He's very broad across his, stre- uh, across his chest. He's got a great forearm, a great gasket on him. He looks fast. He, it, he looks like he should have been a, a dirt horse rather than a turf sprinter. Um, and certainly, you know, he's, he's uh, off to a flying start in, in Europe with his, where the majority of his uh, first runners have been. Tenebrism, obviously, was his first uh, winner for us, uh, for, for Bally Doyle and Aidan O'Brien, early in the year. And she came back uh, two weeks or three weeks ago and won the Chievely Park at, at Newmarket, um, which is, you know, like winning the Alshabides here at Keenan. You know, it's, a, it's an emblematic two-year-old Phillies race at the end of the season. And um, so to, to do that, is very, very important. Um, he's also been represented here by Wesley Ward's Her World, who won uh, a stakes race in her debut in, in Monmouth. So he's had some exposure over here with his early runners. Um, but obviously, the, the flag will be flown in Europe for the coming years. Um, but I think he's a horse that, you know, he bred 170 mares here in his first crop or his first book of mares. He was very popular. Uh, American breeders like him, like him physically. So I think, uh, you know, he's a horse with a lot to offer. Adrian, uh, reading up a little bit about your background, you, you, when Joe asked you a question earlier, you gave us some um, thoughts on that. But I read that one of the reasons why you wanted to come work in America was your love affair with Cigar. Tell us more yeah. about that. Yeah, very interesting. You say we, we, there were two horses, really. Cigar was, was one of them and Thunder Gulch was the other. Um, I, w- I went to a school called Glenstall Abbey School in, uh, in, in Ireland, which is the Benedictine Monastery. And MVJP and Tom Magner also went there. So I was good friends with them from from an early age. And when I was leaving school, I wasn't really hundred percent sure what I wanted to do. So they encouraged me to come over here. Um, I came here for a year. Um, and at that time it was, I came here in, uh, 2001 and was just, I think cigar was finishing up his racing career in 97, 98, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he was on his, on his wonderful run of, um, 18 races undefeated for Bill Martin. I just remember him winning under the lights. You know, obviously a lot of these emblematic, 
uh, American races like the Breeders' Cup. And a lot of these great, great ones happen at night uh, in Europe. So, you know, I, I was got, got accustomed to staying up late following this horse around the country and taking his track everywhere he came. Um, I, I remember vividly watching Thunder Gulch also winning the, the 1995 Kentucky Derby. Um, so it was just a, a love of American racing and, and the horses generally watching these races with my, with my, you know, my friends or my family, uh, late at night, just always sort of had a, American racing had a sort of romanticism for me. So that's, that's really what, what drew me to America. And I came for a year and 20 years later, I'm still here. And, and we're Which appreciative that, that you are still here. Uh, <laughs> I, Adrian, I. <laughs> <laughs> one more question for you about, about, uh, you know, some of the stud fees and, and stallions that, that are, uh, that are over at the farm. Um, Munnings who, you know, in, in, in racing circles, everyone knows of Munnings. They, they know he throws a, a wonderfully, you know, good looking horse. His sales averages are two and a half times what his, what his stud fee is. And now he's taken that extra leap um, into the stratosphere of getting horses that are, you know, Breeders' Cup, uh, you know, worthy and, and Derby and Oaks worthiness. Walk me through, walk us through the process of taking a stallion like Munnings, who has a, you know, a, a great following. He was standing for $40,000, 50, 60, even last year. Um, and now to make the leap to $85,000. He's a very interesting horse, and he's a, he's actually a horse that if you study how his stallion career has evolved, he's really really done it the hard way. I mean, he he was introduced. Um, you know, obviously, we bought him at the two year old sales. He was a, a high priced um, high priced juvenile uh, down in Florida. One point four million, I believe, was what he what he cost as a two year old. Um, Three time grade two winner for for Michael Tabor uh, and uh, Todd Fletcher. Grade one place in the hopeful uh, as a two year old. So obviously he had, he had speed, he had, he, had, he had precocity, but he retired without winning a, a group, the all important group one. Um, we introduced him at a fee of twelve and a half thousand. And while he was always popular, he was you know, he was covering workmen like mares. He was covering the, the sort of middle of the range uh, bunch of mares. But the the thing that he seems to transmit, and certainly transmitted with his early books, that's helped him um, through the sort of the lull that can ev- inevitably happen in the third and fourth book when a stallion isn't getting the same quality or numbers is their longevity. And they seem to have, if you look down his, his, his list of runners every day or his results from the previous days, it's amazing how many four, five, six, seven, eight year olds there are still running. They're very durable horses. And I think when you've got horses in your stable as a trainer, as an owner, and you see horses that are constantly earning you a paycheck, whether at whatever level, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're concentrating mainly on the, on the group races and the, and, the, and the big days, but it leaves a good taste in your mouth as an owner and as a trainer. If you're saying, oh, that money's in the stable, he's six years old now, he's running for me seven or eight times a year, and he's consistently winning races, whether they be allowance races or, or, or smaller stakes. I think that that is very important, not only for a stallion's stats and numbers, but it's very important in, in keeping him relevant and keeping him popular in owners, uh, buyers and breeders' minds. So I think that stood to him. He's now at the stage where he's receiving, you know, very good support from some of the best breeders in the world. I mean, Lee Farron from Jobmont called yesterday and asked to reserve four spots uh, for Munnings for, the, for them. You know, he's receiving mares from, from the likes of Jobmont, Darley, uh, Stone Street, uh, to, to name but a few, and obviously internal support here at Coolmore. So he's he's getting the better mares now and has done for the last three or four years. He's, the best is definitely yet to come with him. I think he's a horse that will eventually, having done it the hard way, will be standing at 100,000. You know, he's got Jack Christopher this year, who's going to be favoured for the, uh, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, um, and obviously Kamari earlier in the year, who won the Madison for Wesley Ward um, in her own backyard here at Keeneland. So he's he's getting... He's getting it done at all levels, Colts, Phillies. Um, and the great thing is, as I said, they're very durable, sound, hard knocking horses. No question about it. And and Adrian, one more question for me. And, and that is, you know, everybody wants to breed to, you know, American Pharaoh and Uncle Mo and, and Justify and the top, top stallions. If somebody came to you and said, Adrian, I have a, a mare that I want to breed um, and I want to, you know, go ahead and, and race the, the, the fall. Is there a stallion that's on your roster, stallions on your roster that maybe are under the radar because they're just not um, necessarily commercial appeal, but they throw hard knocking horses that you would recommend to, uh, you know, to a breeder to, to uh, bring their mare to? Yeah. I mean, I, and you, you mentioned him, you mentioned him before looking at lucky is that is that horse he's gets runners every single year. I mean, he's had a breeder's Cup classic winner. Um, he gets hard knocking, good, strong, 
uh, racehorses every single year. You know, Diamond Dupes is there a better a better uh, you know embodiment of what a stallion is all about? Diamond Dupes is now I think six years old, keeps running with credit every single time. Um, so yeah, yes, looking at Lucky is, is the one for me. He doesn't really get the true sales horse, but if you're looking to breed a racehorse um, for fifteen thousand, I think he's the best the best value we've got. Last question for me. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about Justify. You guys have the, the unique distinction of standing two Triple Crown winners. But I always think it's interesting because there's su- there's such a gap between sometimes when the horse stops running and when the horses go through the sales ring. Obviously, I, I, I think that there's a, a major demand for Justify yearlings. He's, his full, his yearlings sold very well throughout the summer and at Keeneland September. But what has been your sense of the demand since he retired through now? Has it kept up with what you expected? Has it dipped? Has it raised? What, what's your, your feeling about that? Support has been, you know, in his first book, he covered just over 250 mares, which is a, you know, a huge amount. And given the quality that he covered, he covered, um, I think it was 68 or 69 group one winners or producers in his first book. That has continued in his, in his second and third books, uh, even though he covered slightly less, and he still covered good books in, uh, in terms of numbers in the second and third, third crop. But he, um, listen, he's got all the ingredients. He was uh, a wonderful racehorse, so he, albeit over a short period of time, but but I think he took the country by storm in that in that uh, in that uh, in that 114 day spell or whatever it was. Um, the quality of Mercy's bred, the way they looked, the way they sold. Um, he is, is a horse that's got international appeal, as as was witnessed in Keeneland September, especially considering you know three of, the, of his highest priced yearlings uh, were, were bought by Japanese interests. So I think you know he's he's a horse that will have. Certain amount of exposure in Europe as well. We're, we've we're taking a lot of our better ones over to Europe to go to Valley Doyle, so we'll see see how they adapt uh, to European training and European surfaces. So again, like American Pharaoh, he'll get the benefit of an international audience, and um, that I think is, is is very important nowadays. You know, if you you've got all the the buyers who who, who come to Keeneland and come to Basie Tipton, Saratoga. and they want to see international horses and these horses, given their 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 profile and given the breeders that bred to them. And given where they are going to run, uh, we, they've got every chance now of becoming truly international stars. Yeah, and, and you guys do a great job. I, you know, I don't know whether you had a lot to do with it. We appreciate Coolmore coming aboard as a sponsor on the show. We're very honored to have you guys. And we're honored to have you on the show. Adrian Wallace, thank you so much for the time. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. Thank all. you, Adrian. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Adrian Wallace, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. Owning potential future superstars like Flightline is attainable with a racing partnership with West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs all on one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. West Point had another exciting maiden winner over the weekend with Derecho Dandy, who broke his maiden at Santa Anita on Sunday for trainer John Sadler. And this past Friday, West Point added another horse to their list of stakes winners with Morning Twilight, who won the Oklahoma Classics Lassie Stakes and the two-year-old filly is trained by Steve Asmussen, owned in partnership with Edwin Barker and Title Town Racing Stables. Uh, and the, the retired Racehorse Project's Thoroughbred Makeover was held this past weekend and featured four former West Point horses, including Still Dreaming, who was a winner a few years ago for Graham Motion, as a half-brother to Nyquist, um, once he won this, the show hunter division of the, of the show. Uh, it's great. It's great to see the West Point horses being repurposed and, and rehomed and retrained. Um, obviously, fully support that. I know, I know that's something that Terry Finley is passionate about. Uh, but there was also some racing-related results with John Green, always the most important part 
of any segment. Yeah, Joe, we were fortunate enough to have a couple of good horses um, with our friends at West Point Thoroughbred. Two weeks ago, we had SWAT Analysis, who made his um, you know return to the racetrack, a triumphant win, easy hand ride win, and an A other than. Um, and now he's being pointed to the Ontario Derby at the end of the month, um, which is a grade three up in uh, up at Woodbine. Um, and then even more recently and more importantly, uh, turned aside that we own with West Point Thoroughbreds ran a really solid second in the grade two in the Arctic um, and uh, only lost to to millionaire uh, Avis Flatter. So, you know, again, our partnership with West Point Thoroughbred continuing to blossom and, and, and uh, you know, come up with great results. Um, thanks again to trainer Mark Cassie and turned aside right now. We're entertaining some thoughts about maybe sending him to California. Um, if he can get into the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint, we're still working on that. We're still not sure he's going to get in, but he ran a 98 buyer, um, you know, which is really outstanding and good enough to compete in the uh, Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. So stay tuned. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. You know, other than other than Golden Pal, I think it's a pretty wide open field. So I support you guys. I support you guys in that endeavor. I think you're all waiting for my approval on whether yes. or not you can send that horse to California. Don't worry. You have my blessing to send turn aside to California. Um, but yeah, and also I can't wait to see all those high priced yearlings on the track next year because they're gonna be loaded. And, you know, obviously you know, pretty much swept the toppers at Keelan in September. So that's that's going to be very interesting to see how those horses, how those horses pan out. And also Flightline, who I mentioned at the top, still pointing to the Malibu stakes. We're very excited about that. And we said this, we said this last week and the week before that this was kind of kind of the last two weekends that you could possibly run a horse in the prep races and then come over for the Breeders' Cup. So I thought this would be a good week to kind of run down the, the the fields and how they're shaping up and who we can expect to see who's going to get bet hard um and so i'm, I'm just going through some of the, the early betting uh here for obviously we have the uh the the future stars friday on, on friday with all the juvenile races and then we have the rest of the program on saturday on friday it looks like we're going to have pr two pretty solid favorites in the main races with echo zulu and jack christopher obviously both were very very impressive in their their first couple of races you know, Echo Zulu, I think, has been like a little bit less tested than Jack Christopher, just because I think the two year old Phillies have not been quite where the two year old males are at this point. She's currently a two to one early favorite on most books. Uh, Juju's map who won the Darley Alcibiades very impressively is four to one. Um, looking at the at the juvenile Phillies turf, there's nobody right now shorter than five to one. We talked to Adrian Wallace about Tenebrism, who's by Caravaggio, currently five to one co-favorite. So that's going to be a very interesting betting race. But the Juvenile, I think, is going to be a terrific race. And the top three right now in, in the wagering are Jack Christopher Cornish and Major General. Major General, I thought I was going to get a big price on him. Seems like everyone else has sniffed him out, too. He's currently five to one in the early wagering. Uh, I was hoping to get double digits on him. But just moving on to, to Saturday, it looks like we're going to have a couple of really big favorites. And that's kind of going to be the, the the determining factor in whether or not you're able to make money on Breeders' Cup Saturday. Because we got Gamin, who's definitely going to be odds on. She's going to be four to five, three to five. That got John's attention, got him to stop looking at the Keeneland, no, Keeneland November catalog. Um, and then we got uh, Jackie's Warrior in the Breeders' Cup Sprint. He's probably not going to be odds on, but it's going to be pretty short. Baid, who won over the weekend, is coming over for the Breeders' Cup Mile probably going to be a pretty short price along with space blues. I think the, the euros are going to be probably the top three or four choices in, in the mile, the distaff, you know, Latruska is going to be a very short price. It's interesting to see how they bet between her and Malathot. I think those two are going to take the vast majority of the play. It's interesting to see how much of a gap there is between those two. Uh, it looks like Tarnawa is going to come to the turf and going to be very tough to beat in there. But you also have Mishriff. The Dyer is probably going to come over. Uh, we'll see about Love or maybe a couple of the you know, O'Brien horses. Um, but also in the Dirt Mile, I kind of think Life is Good is going to be a short price. And just going through it, you know, Golden Pal in the Turf Sprint. The Classic, I think, that Nick's go is probably going to be like 8-5, to 2-1. to one, But uh, it, that's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out in the wagering. That's my main takeaway so far is that I think Saturday, it looks like there's going to be a lot of favorites and it's going to be on the better to figure out which ones they think are vulnerable. That's going to make the difference in terms of whether or not you're able to make money on that card. Let's just get some general thoughts from you guys on what you're looking forward to and, and some of the horses you're looking forward to seeing at the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, Joe, among these big favorites, I'm not sure any of them are vulnerable. I mean, you know, stranger things have happened, but 
you know, can you see Latruska getting beat? I can't. Can you see Jackie's Warrior getting beat? I can't. Um, Tarno, the, this uh, interesting website. Thanks for sending it by oddschecker.com. Uh, in the uh, turf, I'm surprised Tarno was such a big favorite, seven to four, just a, a hair under uh, two to one. And also to show what uh, they think of the American horses, the top three favorites in there are all European and domestic spending uh, considered our top course for the Breeders' Cup turf is five to one. Um, then, you, you know, this goes to show you, we've talked about this a lot. Look at how deep the classic is. Now, uh, one thing we didn't mention, like Maxfield now is going to pass, which I thought was a little bit of a, an odd choice to do that, to go for the Clark. But they've got Nick's go at three to one, essential quality at nine to two. And look at the kind of horses you're getting for these bigger prices. Medina Spirit at eight to one, Hot Rod Charlie at 10 to one, Max Player at 10 to one, and Art Collector at 12 to one. So you're getting horses like Max Player and Art Collector and Hot Rod Charlie coming off great Medina Spirit as well, coming off grade one wins with really good, strong form on the year going off at eight, 10, 12 to one in there. Um, I'm looking forward to the juvenile very, very much. Jack Christopher versus Corniche. Um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Major General. I'm really focused in on those two. Jack Christopher is five to two in the line. Corniche is four to one. I'm surprised there's that much of a gap between them. Also, these prices seem a little generous. I don't think you're getting three to one on Nick's Go in the Breeders' Cup Classic. I don't think you're getting uh, five to two on Jack Christopher in, in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile uh, through the pair of mutual pools. But you never know. Um, I think the East Coast, West Coast showdown of Jack Christopher and Corniche is going to be fast fascinating and uh that's going to be a really good race um and of course you know let's get back to the horse of the year discussion uh if latruska can win the distaff she puts herself very much in the equation i think nick's go and essential quality would both have to lose the classic and she'd have to win the distaff for her to be horse of the year but um you know should be uh you know she, she's going to be one of the highlights as well and she's just a terrific terrific mayor with that a terrific year yeah, and, and and you guys have gone over all the major important races, so I don't want to you know be redundant. The only thing that that I want to add on um, to Bill, what you were saying before is, you know, I was surprised um, that Maxfield is skipping the uh, the the richest race you know in the United States um, to go into the Clark, and it's not to to denigrate you know or or, or say anything negative towards the. Clark, because it is a grade one. Um, but it was just a surprise to me as to, you know, why you would skip that opportunity um, to, to run in, in the Clark. Um, my guess is they want to have one more G1 next to the horse's name and then possibly retire him. And on a winning note, which which I, you know, I, I kind of understand that that strategy. Um, but man, it, you don't want to see all the powerhouses in, in the big race, you know, out in, in California this year. Um, the other announcement that that uh, you know that, that surprised me a little bit was the fact that Nick's Go, uh, you know, the, the the powers that be owning Nick's Go sold the breeding rights to TaylorMade, or at least the horse is going to stand at TaylorMade, um, you know, once once his career is over. And um, it was interesting to me, you know, as, as to how that that deal kind of came down and, and ultimately, you know, have the horse stand at, at, at Taylor May, um, you know, so obviously they have tremendous rooting interest in the Breeders' Cup Classic, um, but it is a deep field, even with a couple of these defections, um, it is still a really, really deep field and uh, things will continue to develop over the next couple of weeks. Cause like we always say, they're, they're not machines, they're animals and they're athletes and, and horses may get temps or foot problems or, or, you know, a myriad of other things that they can come up between now and then, but it is shaping up to be as solid of a classic group as I can remember in the past few years yeah and you know just touching on the maxfield thing you know it's a great field it's an honestly a terrific one of the best classic fields i've seen in a while but we've talked about this that it looks like there's a lot of speed in there and you would have thought that it would maybe set up for a horse like maxfield so it is interesting that they're they're going to take the you know the the lesser route so you know so to speak and the clark and like you said probably should try to get another grade one win under his belt but I thought he had a decent chance in there, especially if the pace got hot. You know, I, I, I would have been willing to take a shot, obviously not my horse. Um, but one of the things I like is that we, we do have a lot at stake at the Breeders' Cup. We don't want everything to be settled. Obviously, some divisions are settled. The Truska is going to be champion, older, dirt mayor. Um, yeah, I, Jackie's Warrior is probably going to be champion. Sprinter, I don't see who else you can really vote for at this point. But, you I mean, know, horses. I mean, I mean, I mean. <laughs> champion male. Male. M-A-L-E, Sprinter. Um, yeah, I mean, but, you know, Horse of the Year is, is still up for grabs. Champion Turf Female. It's going to be interesting to see if Warlike Goddess 
wins the Philly Ameriturf, but then Tarnowa wins the the Breeders' Cup turf. You know, I've seen horses come over and just run that run that one big race and win, win champion. Uh, so that'll be interesting. And there's a lot. I think there's a lot still to be determined. Two year old male, two year old filly as well. So I, I, that's one of the things I like about it is when the Breeders' Cup is really that kind of showdown to determine the year end champions. It makes it feel like an, a different sport. It makes it feel like the playoffs, you know, in, in a different in a team sport. So that's exciting. And the classic is, is I think going to be one of the best ones we've seen in a long time, plenty of intrigue. Uh, we'll touch on it more once the pre-entries come out and the fields start to take closer shape. We just wanted to, to run down what we've, what we've got going on right now in terms of who's getting bet early. And it does look like Gamine is probably going to be the shortest price in the entire Breeders cup. And it ain't just going to be because of John Green's plunge. I think it just, it's, it's, it's the public. It's the the public can't get enough of Gamine, and there's really nobody else in that race except for maybe Bella, Sophia, and CC. Can't think of anybody else. But, yeah, by no. the way, when he's the top stallion in racing, about six, seven years from now, stay on her good side. Can we breed stay on her good side to Gamine? How about that? Only if Gamine is good enough. <laughs> Right under the bus for the 2023 Queens Plate winner. Man, <laughs> start, start off the Winnebago. We're up there. Eh? Eh? Let's let's get, working on your Canadian accent. Let's get let's get let's get Skip to, Skip to come up with a name for that bowl in 2027. Start working on it, Skip. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Some legacy news this week. Forced ranking was a legacy grab from the 2020 Keeneland September sale. Broke his maiden on Sunday at Belmont for Chad Brown and Clarabish Sables. Obviously very high powered connections. $140,000 son of mastery was the 148th winner of 201 races this year alone by legacy sales graduates. That's pretty, that's a, that's a pretty good stat. Um, you can check out their next consignment at, at the uh, next week's facing Tipton Kentucky, October yearling sale with a roster of over 50 yearlings, including sons and daughters of first crop sires like good magic Mendelssohn, who we mentioned before and accelerate plus top sires like into mischief, American Pharaoh, practical joke, cool more power there as well. And you can also find them next month at the Facing Tipton and Keeneland November breeding stock sales, a very busy time of the year for Tommy and Wendy and everybody at Legacy. So congratulations on the continued success and good luck to getting through this gauntlet in the sales season. And then you guys deserve a break, just like all of us. This broke yesterday and, I, you know, it's not a huge, huge story, I guess, that Simon Callahan got suspended for 15 days and fined $15,000 or $5,000, excuse me, uh, for treating unraced three-year-old Colt Federal Bureau. It was a $1.2 million Keeneland September buy uh, with three shockwave therapy treatments within 30 days prior to a workout. And this is according to a Santa Anita Board of Stewards ruling from October 17th. The suspension will run from November 14th to November 28th. Now, I don't know how big of a deal this is, and that's why I want to bring John in on this. It is worth noting that, you know, shockwave therapy is allowed. It's just, you know, the certain amount of time to a race with, that it's allowed within, and that time has gotten shorter in the last couple of years with Santa Anita trying to crack down on, you know, horses, potentially unsat horses being on the track. Um, I don't, obviously don't know the, the specifics of, of this horse or what his issues may be, but equine shockwave therapy is a treatment widely used on the backstretch for soft tissue, musculoskeletal and bone problems, such as sore shins. Uh, I wonder what John thinks because, you know, it does carry with it concerns, as I'm quoting from Dan's story, over its analgesic properties, which can last up to three days post-treatment. And like I said, CHRB extended that post-treatment window for, for breezing from 10 days to 30. John, have you used shockwave therapy to your, on your horses? 
How much of a benefit do you think it has? How big of a deal is it that Simon Callahan got popped for something like this? Yeah, Joe, you know, not only have I used it on our horses, um, but I've also, you know, spoken to other ath- human athletes that, that swear by it and, and think that it's a great procedure. Um, it's not invasive. It's not anything like um, you're injecting or anything like that. Basically, you're standing on a pad um, for all intents and purposes. And there are, um, you know, they call it shock waving, but in, in reality, it, it, it's, it's just pressure waves that are going through the tissue and trying to stimulate blood flow um, and, and new growth of, of uh, you know, of, of a blood supply to an injured area. So, so the science of it, you know, if you buy into the science, it, you know, makes sense as far as is it going to help any athlete, whether it's equine or human? Um, you know, it, 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 its primary use was for humans for like kidney stones, um, you know, to, to remove the kidney stones or to, to reduce the, the size of kidney stones so they can be expelled from the body. And what they found is that with the, uh, you know, the additional blood flow in the area, um, it did start to have a healing process. Um, you know, so to answer your question, yes, we've used it on our horses. However, like any therapeutic um, product, whether it's it's shockwave or or an actual injectable or or some kind of medication um, or supplement, you have to play within the rules. And if the rules say for that racing jurisdiction that outside of this window before a horse performs on the racetrack, whether it's a breeze or, or a race, it is not acceptable, then that's what you have to, you know, do. Now you can say, well, you know, was it extenuating circumstances where they were using the, uh, you know, the, the, the machine and because of, you know, bad inclement, you know, weather coming up, they moved the horse's breeze up and, and maybe it got, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is as to why it was done. All I know is that if the racing jurisdiction tells you that you can't do it 72 hours to performance, then you can't do it 72 hours to performance. Um, and that's why, you know, there was a fine and, and subsequent penalties, you know, accordingly. Um, it, what, what it shows me, though, is yet another California trainer that is, you know, embroiled in an issue. And, and you know, whether it's through bad management or, or absentee management or, or just a bad decision, I don't, again, we don't know what, what the answer is. Um, but it's yet another California trainer that's embroiled in another issue. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's kind of one of the, the themes of the year that we've seen a lot of California top trainers having either drug violations or, or, or something like this. You know, I, but I appreciate John's insight because I'm not a doctor. I don't know. I, I, like, it sounds bad. Shockwave therapy sounds like very, you know, it, it, I don't know. It, it just sounds like you're doing something to a horse to get it on the track that maybe it should not be on the track, but it sounds like that's not the case. And it's something that's a little bit more, um, you know, commonplace. And this is just something that where the, the, the window before the breeze was, uh, was violated. So, so thanks to John uh, for that insight, but yeah, California racing is, is, has gotten a lot of its top guys in the news recently, kind of for reasons you don't want to be, obviously I don't think this is in particular is that big of a deal. Uh, but that, you know, that's going to come from, you know, we talked about this last week, California and the CHRB becoming more stringent about these types of things, you know, and changing the way business has been done in California for a really long time. So while there are some, maybe some, you know, short-term negative headlines for California, having so many top trainers be on the wrong side of the law in this case, I think overall it's a good thing and they are trying to do the the best they can to protect the horses, you know, which, which hasn't always been the case in America in general. And I'm not just singling out California here. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on, on hopefully the rest of these guys, you know, they take heed from this decision and and from this penalty and then, you know, everybody make sure to do everything within the right time frame. We'll be right back after this message from legacy bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I want to see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. 
All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland Fall Meet goes through October 30th. You can get those bonuses through Keeneland Select by going to KeenelandSelect.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group guest of the week, Adrian Wallace, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, our editors, Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, and Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you also to Bill Farish for stopping by. Congratulations to Skip Anderson. Once again, stay on her good side. Stay on her good side. I almost, I almost screwed it up already is the name of the cult that'll be on track next year. And who knows, maybe he'll, he'll clash with uh, the Philly writer's room at some point. So thanks everybody for watching. Thank you for sending in all those names. We'll do something like that, I think, in the future. But we won't use Sue's email this time. I think she was expecting like five or ten names. She got hundreds of names to her email, so that was kind of funny. But yeah, thanks thanks to all the participation, participation and thank you to everyone for watching and listening. We'll see you next week, I think, back in the studio.